Hello everyone, welcome to The Kevin Lee Show. Thank you for coming on. This is an eight-part series that I will be releasing every week on Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. The preface for this interview is based around a primary question that I learned from Tony Robbins attending his Business Mastery event in Amsterdam. And it is based around if your core business was completely disrupted tomorrow, what would you do? How would you pivot or innovate? And during this time of the recording, we're going through the COVID pandemic. And so I thought it was very fitting interviewing people from around the world in different industries to see how they've pivoted and innovated in their struggling industries. And so the idea is to inspire and encourage people who need it. And so I hope everyone can learn a few lessons from these experts. I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Today we have Matt Jones. He is a creative strategist, accidental entrepreneur, and serial failure. Matt has an eclectic background, combining economics, politics, brand experience, and gin. In 2013, Matt co-founded Four Pillars Gin, a craft gin business based in Hillsville in the Yarrow Valley. Today, when he's not hanging out at the distillery, he's one of Australia's most independent speakers and thinkers on business, brand, strategy, and creativity. I thoroughly enjoyed this interview. And I learned so much. I hope you guys do as well. Please help me welcome Matt Jones. How are you doing today, buddy? Mate, I am well. Apologies for being in headphones today, looking a bit strange. But now we're back to working in real offices. I thought we could do with some decent sound quality, but I'm good, mate. <laughs> no worries at all. Thank you so much for coming on. I know you're a super busy man, and I'm really appreciative that you've come onto the show to share with us a bit about Four Pillars. I'd like to straight away start up. How did you start up um, Four Pillars, this infamous gin company that we've all been hearing about? <laughs> yeah, look, it's six and a half years since we since we launched, and that does feel like a, a kind of a business lifetime. But I guess getting into it, you've probably got to go back. Well, for me, you've got to go back about eight years to 2012. But to get into Four Pillars, you've got to go all the way back to the Atlanta Olympics, which is a very sort of strange place to start. But a guy called Cameron McKenzie ran for Australia in the 4 by 400 metres. So it was a pretty, pretty quick 400 metre runner. And Australia did okay. They made the semis. Cameron did not drop the bat on. He likes to, likes to confirm. And, you know, we went pretty well. And he came back. And in 97, he was running fast. He was, he was one of the, the highest ranked 400 metre runners in Australia. He was kind of, a, you know, a good tip for a, a decent performance at the Sydney Olympics in 2000. And so the, the Australian Olympic movement put him into a kind of Olympic a kind of Olympic training program where you get a job placement and you go do a job that, that allows you to keep training at the same time. But, but slightly counterintuitively, they, they put him in the wine industry, which is not really where you put a, a high-performance athlete. And he meets a guy called Stuart, and Stuart takes him for lunch on his first day. And I think that lunch set the tone that led to Cameron missing out on a place at the Sydney Olympics. And so I guess the 12 years then between Cameron missing Sydney 2000 and 2012 was Stuart trying to make it up to Cameron and they'd played around in wine and and and, and toured around the wine industry and, and they'd started to daydream about the possibility of making gin and I met them in 2012 my background was brand sort of brand strategy brand experience before that it was politics and I guess I was really interested in making something real and doing something that allowed me to maybe take some of the advice I've been giving around brand building and brand strategy and few drinks a few gin and tonics later we we decided to, to, to go down the path and and i guess the, the the path towards four pillars was was begun oh wow that's the will you be also behind the name of four pillars yeah so look i mean the, so that's 2012 and and there's about an 18 month genesis between that and and the gin coming to market and the, i guess a few things happened there you know one was deciding on a gin and an approach to gin and you know that was sort of really shaped by Cameron and Stuart going on a fact-finding mission which it turned out involved all of us putting some money in the bank them flying to Seattle renting a BMW 6 series convertible and driving down to Los Angeles and visiting every distillery they could find along the way and they came back all kind of charged up and going made it fantastic and the americans are making really exciting gin they're not making it the same way as the brits it's all a real you know a, a real kind of unique american style we can do the same here in australia oh by the way every great gin we tasted was being made on a carl still this this still maker christian carl from germany based in stuttgart 
handmade stills that they're, they're the world's best gin machines like we have to have one we've got to have one so we put some more money in the bank and we, we placed an order for a, for a carl still that was going to take about a year to get made and delivered and and sort of in parallel with that we need to start that kind of design process that that creative process and as as you know when you're going to put something in design you need to give the designers a name and four pillars kind of came up casually in conversation and it felt good enough to put into design it felt good enough to be that kind of dummy dummy name that you put in while you look at design language and, and labels and color schemes and all those things and it kind of stuck and and that that idea that solid things are built on four pillars that it's not about doing lots of stuff it's about doing you know four things really really well it became quite a good little mantra and a good little philosophy and so to this day that the, the name is stuck but it's really been something that i guess we've given We've given it more meaning and given it more resonance over time, but it's never been about having some big brand story about the four pillars. It just, it's just what we're called over the last six and a half years has then invested that with hopefully some level of meaning. Great, great. I wanted to also ask you, how did you get your first product line into distribution in a saturated marketplace? Yeah, so it, the way that we launched, I think, was was rather serendipitously connected to to that sort of that genesis story if you like and serendipity i think comes up a few times but the first sort of deeply serendipitous thing was just the gift of time because cameron and stewart came back from the states with this absolute conviction we had to have a christian car still that immediately baked time into our in, in into our journey it meant that we couldn't just go to market quickly. We couldn't fire out a quick batch of gin and slap a label and everything could take time. And, and I think, you know, in hindsight, that's helpful because I'm probably the most, Cameron's the most pragmatic, I'm the most patient and Stu's the most bullish. And without that sort of forced factor of time of the three of us, Stu would have probably driven us on and told me, Matt, stop overthinking it, let's get it done. And and, and I guess we, we, we got to do two things with, with that time. And, and the second of them actually answers your question. And the first was we got to really think about brand purpose, which is something I'm, I'm particularly passionate about. And, and, you know, when you hear that notion, sometimes people mean very specifically social purpose. You know, they think of brands like Tom's Shoes or Warby Parker that have a kind of a, a social good DNA to them. But in, in our case, I just mean something more simple and fundamental which is why do you exist like why do you exist why do you matter those sort of somewhat navel gazing questions and for us we said well look you know we we reckon there's an opportunity to elevate the craft of distilling gin i mean we've tasted all these gins in america that are completely different to what the brits are making and frankly and respectfully australia is a better tasting place in america we've got a we've got a, a a greater range of unbelievable produce indigenous botanicals these unbelievably diverse food cultures if gin can taste of place we're the best tasting place on earth we should be able to elevate gin so let's do that and so we really placed craft and making and exploring at the heart of why we existed not profit not marketing not growth but a real sense of craft at the heart in terms of how we launched the other thing that time gave us was the opportunity to experiment and one of the things i was really interested in was crowdfunding this idea that you could bring uh, a bunch of people on on the journey with you and and you know talking about startup i guess there were two communities that we brought with us the first was a little community of small investors we recognized that being a craft-led business again back to that decision with the world's best still back to that decision was going to be expensive and it was going to take a while to get that to any form of sustainable profitable scale so you then have a choice either you're going to compromise the craft and take shortcuts or you need enough money in the bank to be able to weather that storm and make it through because we decided in that purpose conversation to be led by a craft we went okay we've got to get some investors on board we would rather own a smaller share of a company with long-term potential than own all of a company that could never afford to do things properly so that was the first group that was 20 people 20 investors took two percent each so before we even launched the three founders owned 60 percent and we had 20 large investors who were friends and family and people we knew through work who, who took two percent each but then the crowdfunding was that second group we ended up selling that first batch of gin to 300 customers who to this day remain what we call our batch number one customers and they have in perpetuity early exclusive access to every new product that we make and i think what that did was it wired a dna of of customer intimacy of believing that even if you have global aspirations a small group of people who have real conviction 
who have real passion for your brand will do more for you than a much larger group of people who don't really care, who don't really know you, who don't have a sense of ownership. And I think that that DNA of, of, of customer intimacy, of believing that we can build a craft business to a global scale, one customer at a time, one great interaction at a time, you know, seven years later, that's still at the heart of what we do. But that, but that's the that's the that's the long answer to your short question, Kevin. We launched through crowdfunding. We launched through Stuart leveraging his his great relationships with the trade and the media to create a bit of noise. We launched, fortunately, at a time when gin was really taking centre stage, but Australian gin hadn't taken off. And we launched at a time when, fortuitously, the guys at Dan Murphy's Australian retailers in general, but Dan Murphy's really notably. We're excited about getting behind a local craft movement. So all those forces kind of came together in December 2013 through to March 2014, which is when we won our first double gold medal for our original rare dry gin at the San Francisco World Spirits Cup. That four-month period, we went from non-existent to suddenly, wow, we're here and we're significant players in this little market. Wow. What a journey and what a story. So to recap, yeah, the most of it, it all kind of started in 2012. Yep. And then the team went over to the US and started to learn more about it and get obsessed and really passionate about gin, thinking you can, guys can take it back to Australia and produce an ever better product. You, decide, you guys decided to order a, is the car still. Carl, yep. Yeah, car still, which takes about a year. And within that year period, you guys have doubled down, knuckled down and focus on the branding, how are you guys going to do this? And I, I really love that part of the story because I'm, I'm quite the opposite. So I, I like to move into things quick and then reiterate quick. Mm. Whereas this one, I think it plays along one of your strengths that you mentioned is, which is patience. Mm. And so within that year, it was really about being patient about how, how are you going to tackle this? And instead of going on uh, a low to mid end, you guys ended up going uh, on quality and on craftsmanship, as you mentioned to go and uh, figure out this is for a long-term vision. We, we want to take this as far as we can. And I really do admire the, the strategy that you took because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see that very often anymore. A lot Look, of people come head first. Yeah. And it's really interesting, right, because, you know, I, you know it's also a mild background of, of working in, in sort of brand agencies. You, you realize that constraints drive creativity and strategy enables agility so you know yes there is a there is a patience and there's a plannedness and there's an anchoring in purpose but actually it's those things that then helped us be incredibly fast moving so the speed at which we've developed new gins we've launched more different collaborative wildly creative multi-awarded gins in in those six and a half years than, than any other gin distillery on the planet the speed with which cameron and his team in the distillery were able back in march april to help us pivot into making hand sanitizer from the, the byproducts of gin. And, and we might come back to that in a bit, but because there's clarity of thought at the heart of what we're about, it's then allowed real speed. So I think there was a, as I said, it was serendipitous. I don't think it was in our nature to be slow and it's never been in our nature since then to be slow, but that, that little period of going, well, why are we doing this? And, and, and what, what's going to anchor our success has, has then kept us really honest as we've made often very, very quick but always hopefully quite anchored and thoughtful decisions. Mm. Uh, that's very impressive. <laughs> you guys got so much variety of genes. I've, I've taken a look and I thought, wow, this is crazy. So in regards to it, how, how was the work of launching and maintaining four pillars divided among the partners? Yeah, look, this is, this is really, I think, a, it's key to the DNA of the business and B, it's another one of those sort of examples of, of serendipitous, are definitely not planned outcomes. I think looking back now, there are probably four pillars. There you go. That's fortunate. Everything, everything's in fours now. I think I used to, when I was a strategist, I used to always, everything had alliteration. Like every time I wrote a strategy for someone, everything would start with the same letter. And now alliteration doesn't matter, but everything's in fours. But, you know, looking back, there are, there are sort of four key pillars to our success. And I think one of the really interesting things is that the, the three co-founders embodied three of those four. And really the fourth was a blind spot for just the right amount of time. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. So you've got Cameron. 
he's he's a guy who manages to get his body around a, an athletics track fast enough to qualify for the Olympics. He's got that sense of unbelievable grit and determination and pragmatism to be able to do that. Turns out he applies that to everything. And he also happens to have a fantastic palate. So when you put those two things together, you couldn't have a better recipe for a world-class distiller. And right now, you know, a member of last year, Four Pills was named world's leading gin producer. And, and, and really that's him. He, he is as good a gin distiller as there is on the planet right now. And I can say that with no hubris and no arrogance because it's nothing to do with me. That's all his talent. So Cameron really brought both distilling excellence and pragmatism and an ability to, to move mountains and make things happen. He's your startup engine. Stuart, very different person, came with this incredible ability to build relationships, uh, incredible number of pre-existing relationships across food, wine, hospitality, business. He has extraordinary charisma, extraordinary ability to, to tell stories and command attention, open doors. And so he naturally became this kind of igniter of relationships and this creator of opportunities. And then you have me and, and we have sometimes been called the tinker the drinker and the thinker and so you know I was, I was i was the thinker of the piece and it was for me to go okay well where can this go and 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 how can we plan that out and you know cameron always tells the story of how you know i was i was really the one who said look we can be craft at scale and what does that mean and what does it take to get there and what does a what does a contemporary craft brand look like and and why does it why is it so important for example for a brand with craft in its dna to not say okay, if craft is what makes this gin different, all we need is for the gin to be extraordinary and the craft that went into it to be extraordinary. We also need a bottle and a label and photography and storytelling and packaging, all of which embodies that same sense of craft because people, people need those cues, those semiotics of craft. They need that sense of what you stand for at every touch point. It's no good everything being mediocre, but the, but the product's great. Everything else has to embody those. And so it was really for me to just sort of codify that as a strategy and a philosophy and a marketing plan to complement their skill sets. So with that, brand, relationships, gin and production, those three, three sort of pillars, if you like, we went into the world and started making the best gin we could and mo the most noise we could and telling the most beautiful stories we could. And we started collaborating with people and doing things that no one else has done. You know, our, our distiller series where we, we approach distilleries we admire from other parts of the world and we say, let's make a gin together. I don't think anyone else had done that. I don't think many brands in other categories do that. They tend to be too defensive of their IP. Our realization that, while we had great gin ideas, bartenders had great flavor ideas. Let's invite bartenders to come in. And that's how we make the world's only dedicated Negroni gin, for example. It was the, the genesis of our, probably the most awarded gin anyone makes in the world. A Four Pills Navy Strength gin came from a conversation between us and the guys at the gin palace about our, our original gin. Those three pillars, I think, propelled us to a point where we kind of ignored the fourth pillar, which was commercial and financial success. And as a result, for the first five years, the tail didn't wag the dog. And then the dog starts to get so big, and I think this metaphor is going to stretch and I'll break it. The dog gets so big that you need to start focusing on the tail. You need to start understanding the commercial dimension. But in a way, and then we added that in, and we've got some brilliant people, and we now have a, a very grown-up thing called an SLT, and we've got our senior leadership team, and there's a finance director and a couple of trade directors and a marketing director, and they, they work to support, work really closely with me, Stu and Cam. But I think... Actually navigating the world without that commercial pillar to start with has helped to shape the DNA of the business where it is the craft, it is the relationships, it is that sense of warmth and friendship combined with great gin, combined with a great brand that now continues to power four pillars in the world. And then we've added commercial on. I think it's much harder to do it the other way around. It's much harder to take a brand that's built out of commercial considerations to start with and then give it heart. Whereas four pillars for five years was all hard, lots of mistakes, lots of missed opportunities, but never compromised around the gin, never compromised around the brand, never missing an opportunity to build or deepen a friendship and a relationship. And then after five years, we just had to figure out, okay, how do we make sure that we're making the most of this commercially and this is actually sustainable? But by that time, we had a pretty extraordinary brand.
Man, I love those four pillars. So let, let me just quickly recap that for everyone. Yeah. So one of the first is the gym artist, yep. uh, Cameron. And then you have Stuart, the relationship builder. Yep. You have yourself, yourself, which is the branding. And then, which is a great place to start already. I'm thinking, okay, that's a super team that you already have. And then from there, you guys realized five years on that you needed that commercial financial arm to come in and, and really push you guys and propel you guys forward. Exactly. And, and you know, the, the risk, as we all know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, the commercial people come in and they go, well, your, your cost of goods is too high over there or your price is too low over there or you spend too much money doing these things that don't create a demonstrable return on investment. Why do you keep flying bartenders down from Sydney and overseas to come and hang out with you and make gym with you? Mm. And we'd say, well, because we are a world-class gin distillery in Australia. Almost every other world-class gin distillery in the world is in the other hemisphere. These bartenders in Sydney have no opportunity unless they win a competition to go and visit Hendrix or Bombay Sapphire. We can bring them down and we can build a relationship for life. And the commercial guys can go, yeah, but, but show me the return on that investment. Show me how many more bottles of gin at what margin their bar bought because of it. And we'd say, well, that's not really the point. We believe in intimacy. You know, we launched through crowdfunding and we've built intimate relationships with our end customers. We've also wanted intimate relationships with the trade. And so there's been a, an instinctive theory around how we've built this business. And, and obviously it's great to have, once that's set, it's really great to have people come in and interrogate that and test it and refine it. But at that point, what the brand is all about, what the business is all about is set in stone. It's, it's mm. too established to really break. Whereas early on, there could be a lot of second guessing. There could be a lot of, of sort of actually failing to make those long-term investments. You know, if brand is about relationship, is about trust, is about authenticity, is about building a community of people who care deeply, who would cross the street for your brand, then you're going to need to make long-term decisions and not all of them are going to be easily measurable. So I think, I think it was critical that we brought that in at the right time, but it was also critical that early on we had those three skill sets that really built that, that richness into the brand and we had that very, very initial decision to go and get some gym investors, that's what we called our, our little investors, very original of us, to go and get some gym investors to put, help us get a little war chest together so we could make those patient long-term decisions and not be panicking about the commercials too soon. And with that, I wanted to go a little bit deeper. What would you consider to be some of the best lessons a Harvard Business School class might learn from the decisions that you guys have made? Uh, oh, look, it's, it's lovely to think that anyone at Harvard is ever going to learn about four pillars, which may or may not happen. But if, if, you know, if, if I was dropped in there tomorrow, and I suspect if, if, if Stu or Cam were dropped in there tomorrow, we'd, we'd probably say similar things. And, and for me you know, three or four really come to mind. You know, one is the importance of being able to articulate to yourself that sense of purpose before you get into product. I think a lot of people out there, and I used to do a lot of consulting to entrepreneurs, and typically an entrepreneur has a product idea or they have a consumer insight. And they, they are really challenged by the question, yeah, but why are you doing it? Why do you have the right to deliver that product? Why do you have the right to respond to that consumer insight? Well, I thought of it. It's like, yeah, but, but you need more than that. And you need to understand what are you bringing to that? And so that real sense of self-interrogation will help you make decisions down the line. Don't underestimate that. You Harvard Business School people might think that purpose is a bit waffly and there's no substitute for a business plan. But I tell you what, the world is going to change in three years faster than your business plan can keep up. But your purpose if clearly articulated and clearly understood, that is going to be able to survive any number of pandemics and disruptions and black swan events and changing landscapes. So don't underestimate that. And the second thing is believe that things can be done better and believe that better actually count. So the way I tend to sum that up is this sense of craft. Like Four Pillars, we have doubled down on our craft. We do not bore our customers with purpose. Like this, this type of conversation I'm having with you, Kevin, is the only time I ever talk about Four Pillars purpose. What I want to talk to customers about is our craft, like this absolute obsession with being better at making delicious gin than anyone else in the world. And that's something you get up every day and you work on. It's your craft because 
it's never perfected because you're constantly exploring. There's a constant sense of curiosity, determination to get better. I think sometimes in the business landscape, there is a skepticism about whether better things do better in the market. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of this belief that, well, you could just make it. It's almost that if you read Seth Godin's books on marketing, there's almost this 20th century concept that the product just has to be good enough and then the marketing will take care of the rest. I would say in the 21st century, this, this socially wired, much more transparent world, you need to focus on your craft, whatever category you're in, so that your product is better. Because then marketing becomes more organic. It becomes far more frictionless to, to build brand. And your customers become your greatest marketing engine, which is the third thing, which is that social media has a real and powerful way uh, a real and powerful sort of potential to build a brand. Like you can build a real grown-up global brand on social media. It's not, it's not a fad. Um, but you need to understand the power of social media differently. And just because you can run an ad on Facebook and you can run an ad on on Instagram and you can run pre-roll content on YouTube and you can even run sponsored content on LinkedIn and now TikTok's going crazy for commercial content it doesn't make these things advertising platforms and really what's going to reward modern 21st century brands is that sense of purpose that translates into craft that's delivered in the form of great experiences. And it's the way that other people talk about those experiences through social media. It's the way that other people photograph them and share them. That's when social media can really become rocket fuel for you. And so believing in those three things, believing in, the importance of clarity of purpose, the importance of doubling down in your craft so you do genuinely make something better in some specific way, whether that something is a product or a service or an experience, and believing that then the way that you, you light the rocket fuel of social media is not by running advertising through it, but actually by creating and curating experiences that bring that craft, bring that purpose to life one customer at a time, I think that's stuff that Harvard Business School would benefit from because it's probably not part of the core MBA business playbook. I really love the part where you focus on purpose and craft because, as you mentioned, purpose is something that doesn't, it's not something that changes very often. Mm. And a lot of times, you know, we're both in business, everyone's like, oh, what, what was your business plan like? And it's like, there's, as you mentioned before, the world changes so fast our business plans can't keep up. But if we're congruent with our purpose and what we do in our actions, then they will continue to strive through any pandemic or anything that happens. And craft is something that cannot be perfected, as, as you mentioned. It's something that we will continually develop. In my previous life, I, and I, obviously I still have a cafe, <laughs> but I used to do a lot of competing in the coffee industry. And I was um, always searching for that perfect cup. And it was something where, where we broke it down to even a molecular level. I was building my own water to extract coffee. We had all the judges. It was treated as a science, literally, mm. uh, as I'm sure gin is to your craft as coffee is to my craft. And I can, I can empathize with, with that um, passion and that obsessive drive to continually create something better. And each time you do that, you then create that next level experience for people to try. And every time they try that, it becomes, an, they become educated. They then use that education and knowledge to then share, which then creates that virality that you're mentioning. Exactly. And, and, and the magic is when that stack of, of, of sort of pieces of the jigsaw line up perfectly. So the, the, the craft that you're honing in whatever business you're in, and, and, and you and I are talking here about things that, that, that anyone listening, anyone watching would would acknowledge as a craft. But the truth is you could be an accountant and your great craft is the way that you handle and navigate people through the difficult and awkward conversations around financial, around financial planning or whatever it may be. Everyone can have a craft, something they hone and work on that, that, that differentiates, that distinguishes them from their peers. What you've got to make sure is, is two things. One, that that actually aligns with your purpose because there's no point building out craft if it doesn't really align with what you are trying to do in the world. So you're becoming more and more deeply expert at something that is not in support of a bigger idea. And then the other side of it is making sure that 
that sense of craft and that sense of purpose shows up in the experiences you're giving people. Because if they don't do that, then something, the opposite of magic happens, which is you don't get credit. And, you know, I talked about like this idea that brand is trust and it's reliability and brand is, is, a, is an instinctive bias that people have in favor of, of one business and, and over others. But, but also um, brand is credit. Do people give you the credit that you deserve for what you've done? Do they notice? You know, you're not going to get the credit. If you're running the best cafe in town with the most extraordinarily delivered coffee every time, people are only going to talk about that in the ways that you want to talk about if they notice it and if they give you credit for that. And so how do you make sure that that experience is packaged together? So for Four Pillars, you know, one of the first things we decided, you know, when, when, when our first still showed up, that Carl still came after 12 months from Germany, and Cameron at the time was working in a winery in the Yarra Valley. And, and the guy he was working with, a great guy called Rob Dolan, makes fantastic wine. And Cameron was, was in there as his general manager. And, and Rob just said, Cam, just take, take some space down the back of the winery. And we literally sort of put Wilma in there. We named that first still after Cameron's late mum, Wilma. And we put Wilma in there and, and we had to put up a little cage to separate it from the rest of the, uh, the winery. And in there, he started to make gin. And we very quickly realized, okay, people are only going to give us the credit for the way that we're making gin, for the care, for the attention to detail compared to the big commercial guys, if they can come and visit, we've got to get this out of this winery and into a place we can call home. And so we very quickly started looking for a home. We found this beautiful old timber shed in Healesville, happened to be 150 meters from where Cameron lived. And so that became the Four Pillars Distillery and it became just natural that we then said, well, we've got to build a distillery door onto that and, and the four dots of four pillars become these four big round windows. So the, the ultimate four pillars brand experience is not what you can add. It's, it's driving out to Hillsville. It's walking into this place that smells unbelievable as the stills discharge all these incredible botanical aromas and doing a tasting and having a drink while looking through, through those four windows and watching Cameron and his team distill. It's that, it's that sense of closeness and that's, how we get credit, not by making ads, not by, by yelling at people about it, but simply by inviting them to come closer and see it. But that, that lineup of purpose craft experience in, in ways that make sure you get the credit for what you stand for. I think that's the, that's the magic piece. And if you do that to your point, you switch on effect number four, which is your customer community become your advocates, become your, your engine of growth and storytelling. And you don't have to spend money on it because they're doing it for you. And you can continue to focus on your craft, on your experience, and on whatever the next expression of your purpose is going to be. Mm. Another valuable lesson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to take this all in, but lucky I've got all this recorded, so I can take all the notes down later. <laughs> I also wanted to bring the conversation to something you've mentioned previously. You've mentioned serendipitous moments a few times. Yeah. And it's something I, I wholeheartedly believe in as well, when you connect the dots backwards. What events in your life did you consider failures at the time that you think has set you up for later success? I think the, 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 the litany of failures in my life, probably that there's, there's the personal ones and then there's the four pillars ones. And, and you know, the, the personal ones for me, actually, you know, I'll start with the four pillars ones because they're, they're shorter and then we'll, then we'll take the little two minute diversion. I mean, I think there are lots of things we failed to do at four pillars, but they weren't really failures. They were just, they were just decisions almost taken for us. You know, we looked at, you know, Stuart and I are in Sydney. Melbourne's probably Australia's leading sort of cultural capital and creative centre. It would have made sense to build Four Pillars as an urban brand, either in Melbourne or in Sydney. And both of those would have potentially powered enormous success and, 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 and a sense of visibility and, and traffic and, 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 and engagement with people. But Cameron was going to be the distiller. He was going to be the guy who had to do the work and he wasn't going to leave the Yarra Valley. And so by failing to persuade Cameron to leave the Yarra Valley, we've ended up with a, a gin brand that has this amazing DNA of wine country driven through it. So for example, our, our most arguably most iconic product is Bloody Shiraz Gin, a, an annual product we make where we take Yarra Valley Shiraz grapes and we steep them in gin for about eight weeks and the, the grapes soak up all the gin and we press the grapes and that comes the gin and it's blood red full of natural sweetness. It's unbelievable. There's no way on earth we would have done that had we been built in the city. And 
things like that that aren't necessarily capital F failures, but they are things that happened that perhaps if we had been able to make a free choice at the time, we'd have chosen something different. But in terms of, I guess, a more sort of concrete sense of failure, for me, you know, I, I, I graduated, my, my bachelor's degree was as an economist. And there's not a lot you can do with an economics degree unless you're very motivated to go into investment banking or something like that. And I, I didn't have the, I didn't have the head or the passion for that. And so I went to work for the UK government. I, I went to university in the UK and became a government economist. And really strangely, the the you joined the government economic service, which is this kind of fast stream, like high performance stream, but for economists. And they, they, they have a chat with you and then they sort of match make you with a role. And bizarrely, the role that they, they, they sort of paired me up with was in military intelligence. And so I went in age 21 as the only dedicated economist in the what was called the defense intelligence staff, which was the military intelligence wing of the Ministry of Defense. So we would partner with MI6 and we'd partner with the Foreign Office to, to put together intelligence analysis of countries that the UK was interested in or threatened by or whatever it may be. And as a result, the type of economics I started to do was really intertwined with political analysis, with understanding how countries worked, understanding you know, where, 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 where was there going to be a coup? Where would the, the government no longer be able to pay the pensions of the army and, and missiles were likely to start going missing and really fascinating stuff that pushed out of technical economics. And so I started to find the politics more interesting than the economics. I moved to the treasury, got really involved in, in analysis of the former Soviet Union, the former Yugoslavia. I was, I was involved at the time of the Kosovo War and I found myself briefing briefing the prime minister on what was going on in, in, in Kosovo and, and finding myself increasingly better at the communications than I was at any form of policy analysis. So after a, a brief detour around Australia of 12 months, when I went back to the UK, I, I shifted from government into politics and from policy into communications. And, and you know, just as I've failed as an economist, but was good at the communications, I failed in politics and lost a series of elections, but became increasingly interested in, in, brand and how to a tribal identity is formed and frustrated that the party I was working for failed to understand what was wrong with its brand. And they thought that there was, there was a great saying, someone smarter than me once said that the problem with this party is they think that an election is a courtroom and the doors are locked, but the problem is the voters can leave at any time. So you don't win by prosecuting the government. We're in opposition. We're not going to win by prosecuting the government. We're going to win by persuading people that we've changed and they feel differently, but we never took on the innate challenge of rebuilding our brand and so when i then left the uk and came to australia i also left politics behind and moved more properly into brand and and so i suppose there was a you know my, my sort of first 10 15 years of my career was a, a succession of, of of becoming good at something other than the thing i was supposed to be doing and kind of moving from economics to politics and from politics to brand and you know from there i can't find i mean look there are a million and one pitches I worked on that didn't go anywhere. But but from there, it really was just that honing craft phase of becoming better and clearer at thinking about really two things. One, how brands got built. And the second was the role of experiences and the stories that other people tell about experiences in building great brands. As, as the, the creative director behind most of Apple's iconic advertising of the, of the, of the, the 80s and 90s once said, the best ad we ever made was the Apple store. You know, for all of the beautiful kind of, you know, 1984 ads and things like that, the greatest ad they ever made, this is Lee Clow at TBWA, the greatest ad we ever made was, was the Apple Store, that embodiment of the Apple experience. So I guess that, that, that next decade was really around working in that space. And, and you know, it was, it was my failure ultimately to take my agency life and build my own agency that then led to putting the agency aspirations to one side and, and becoming a gin maker instead. That is one of the most fascinating stories I've heard for a while. <laughs> it's someone's journey <laughs> going from economics to politics to branding, and uh, obviously, here we are with the, with the gin company. A little bit of gin. <laughs> yeah, you never know where you end up, right? Yeah, oh, exactly right. right. Ex exactly right. And I think you know, at a, at a at a personal level, the you know, we talk about craft at a business level, but I think it's the same thing at, at a personal level. I think what's really key is is that self understanding of what are you, what are you good at, and finding new and different places and ways 
to apply that capability. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't blogged for years, but, you know, I remember when I had to set up a blog, I called it Think Story Experience because I'm like, what am I good at? You know, I'm, I'm very rarely, especially in my old world, very rarely the smartest person in the room. Like when you're working in government and politics, you've got unbelievable brains in the room. But what I found is I would consistently think more clearly. I'd be able to take the complexity and the cleverness in the room and, and crystallize that. I found I was very good at taking that complexity and crystallizing it and then turning it into storytelling. And then as I developed in my career, I became really quite good at thinking about how that story could live in the form of an experience. And, and so I said, well, okay, that's the stuff I do. Now I can pretty much navigate the world and apply that to different situations. So, you know, I've run strategic planning days for chamber orchestras. I've consulted to the sport of triathlon in Australia. I've worked on Samsung's global TV strategy. I've, you know, talked to, Ford and Volkswagen about how to change the way that their dealerships work and sell cars. And now I'm here making gin and, and they're very different areas, but what doesn't really change is that understanding, okay, what value can I bring to this room? How can I apply that craft that hopefully I have to this situation? Mm. I think also the other advantageous point that you have there is in branding, you get to consult or work with so many different brands and get to see and understand how they think and how they work and what's important to them. Hmm. And each time it, you, you are practicing and developing that craft that you, that you, you're passionate about. Look at it. And I think on that point, you know, we, we entered into a business partnership with Lion just over 12 months ago, the big Australian beer uh, brewers. And before that, for the, for the first five, five and a half years of four pillars, I was still, I was still consulting. I was still running my own little brand purpose consultancy. And I think that was great. I think, you know, that was hard work having a startup business and, and your own consultancy at the same time. To your point, there's a sense of freshness that comes from working on other people's brands in multiple different categories. There's a, there's a, you're not just stuck in that echo chamber. And if there's one challenge I've got now is, you know, now I like Stu, like Cam, we've all gone full time. We're all fully committed, all skins in the game. And that's great. But now you've just got to fight to keep yourself fresh and not get trapped in that bubble, in that echo chamber where you're just listening to the same stuff, including listening to yourself a lot. And instead, get out of there, get out of your head, get out of your bubble and see what else is going on and, and try and maintain that freshness. That's it. That's it. I wanted to also ask, I was looking up doing some research and I, you've mentioned before in your talks that you take mistakes stupidly serious. Could you elaborate and share more about your thoughts on mistakes and how do you define a mistake? Yeah, mistakes. I've got a, as you know, I've got a 10 year old daughter and you know, there's, there's a fundamental hypocrisy here because all I want her to know and my son to know who's eight is that mistakes are awesome. Mistakes are how we learn. Mistakes are, they're part of the creative process. They're part of the process of doing something different. When I've said in the past, and it's true I've said that, that I take them stupidly seriously, it's that I then, I, I'm not very good at taking my medicine. I tend to dwell on the mistake. I tend to dwell on why did that happen? I, I don't like the feeling that having made a mistake, we're not going to learn the lesson of that mistake. I don't like the feeling that we are not debriefing. And there's a, there's a, there's a book that you may or may not be able to see behind me that I read last year called Extreme Ownership. And it's a, it's a book about leadership written by a couple of ex-US Marines. Okay, and Yeah, Yoko Willing's book. And, and I really liked uh, a phrase that he used in there, this notion of autopsy without blame. When things go wrong, you need to conduct a complete autopsy. You need to understand at every level from strategies, tactics, why did that go wrong? But you need to do it without blame. And if you do that, you can learn and you can move forward as a culture. And I suppose that for me is what I mean by taking them very seriously. I want, I want the autopsy on the mistake. I don't want it to become a blame game. I don't want it to stop us making a different mistake. But I do feel slightly nauseous about the mistake we made. And I don't really want to repeat that mistake. Are there any quotes or ideologies that you live your life by? Personally, no, I don't. I talk, I say a lot of things over and over again, but I would try and pretend I'm not a broken record, so I can't, 
currently think of any of them. I do have, there are a few kind of mantras at Four Pillars. I think the main one is this notion of makers, not marketers. Again, I think it's really important. You know, I talked about this with purpose. It's very important to have simple mantras as a business that, that capture thought processes. But just because they exist doesn't mean you need to tell your customers all about them. I think people often get, often confuse the idea of internal mantra with external slogan. You know, so we're not going to go out there. You're not going to see four pillars ads in bus shelters across Sydney this summer saying makers, not marketers. It's not relevant, but it is absolutely a, a, a mantra that anchors an ideology in the business about the fact that the maker wakes up every day with a desire to make new and different and better things. And some of them will succeed and some of them will fail, but the maker will make them anyway because the maker is fundamentally creative and curious and collaborative. See, I said I like alliteration. And, and that's what it is to be a maker. The marketer says, stop making that stuff. You don't know if there's a market for it yet. You don't know if people want to buy it or at what price or what the cost of goods will be. So you can't just start making these things. We need to figure out all the marketing stuff, all 97 P's. So that notion of being makers, not marketers is about staying honest and authentic and true to those original three pillars of does Cameron think this is a fantastic gin? Do I think it fits in with the brand we want to be? Is Stuart excited about sharing it with the world? Then let's make it and let's figure out the commercials later. So in a way that that little three word refrain captures a lot of our instincts, but just packages that nicely and just becomes a little reminder that sort of sits on our shoulder to, to not go too far adrift. Makers, not marketers. Love that. <laughs> we try. <laughs> Are there any new beliefs or behaviors that have had a positive impact in your life in the recent years? I'm not sure there's anything particularly, I mean, look, you're learning all the time, but at what point does updated information become a new belief? I, I don't know. I, I think certainly, you know, I was back in 2009, I was a great social media skeptic. And by 2013, when we're launching Four Pillars, I, I fundamentally believe that, that social media could be a, a transformative force for particularly for startup and craft and disruptive businesses. But you know, you're probably asking about something more profound here as well. I think probably up to about five, probably for the first five years of four pillars, I, I, I probably believed it was an inevitability that I would work every weekend. And then you start to realize that you can better manage time and particularly having small children you're sort of under an obligation to do so and realize you can you can delegate more and you can trust people more and you can still be as effective and you don't have to have a kind of almost like a hero syndrome where if you're not putting in the longest hours you're not delivering so that's that's shifted a bit and that clearly has a positive impact on work life balance but mm -hmm. on the whole you know pretty much the same flawed human i was 15 years ago yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and since you, you mentioned the, the whole work-life balance and you have a beautiful family, how are you juggling time at the moment going all out with, with four pillars as well as your life? Look, I think, I think, I think the juggle is okay. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked and written quite a bit about the challenge of the, the COVID lockdown. And I think all of us probably have to be braced to navigate more periods like that over the next little while, whether that's in Australia or in other countries that are struggling right now. I do think that period of, of navigating work, work from home, school from home was as, was as trying a, a period as I can remember, just that, that, that juggle of time and space and attention and emotional energy. So I wouldn't claim that I did that particularly well. And I suspect in, in moments of honesty, most people would be the same. But look, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's hard not to descend into cliches with this stuff. I think, the, I think the, the juggle is reasonable, but I also think that work-life balance, everyone's going to be different for me. I'm lucky to do stuff in my work that I'm passionate about in my life and that I enjoy talking about. And I probably don't have very hard lines between the two. Not everyone has that privilege to do stuff that, that energizes them, but, but I do. And, and as a result, there isn't a very hard line, but I guess I've just done small things. Three years ago, I took email off my phone. Mm -hmm. I realized that that instantaneous availability was not actually necessary it wasn't necessary for the business or helpful for me if people needed me desperately they could send me a whatsapp or a text an email could be something that i could engage with on my own terms i still check it far too early in the morning and far too late at night and far too often on the weekends but at least it doesn't follow me on my phone right right great tip 
taking email off your phone. True. We can all, we can all do with a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> what have you implemented from your own toolkit have helped you through times of doubt and difficulty as we are entrepreneurs? It's, there is always lots of doubts and there's always lots of challenges. How do you navigate through that space? Look again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, from, I'm answering from a very privileged position, but I'd say we've not really had much time to really have too much doubt. Probably the most sort of doubt ridden period of, of my career would have been turning up in New York at the, just towards the tail end of the, the global financial crisis into a, into a New York agency that was an absolute turmoil and having to rebuild. And I think there it was really about, you know, the, the, the cliche of one foot in front of the other and, and just starting to go to work and started doing and trusting in your ability to do stuff well and, and knowing if you're doing good work, the results will come. I think more broadly as, a, as a, in the entrepreneurial space, the thing that always gives me energy and, and lifts me out of any little dip I might have fallen into is just the opportunity to talk to people about what we're doing like telling the story of your business, telling the story of your strategy. Sometimes we don't hear that enough. We're not reminded enough of the power of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And simply by telling others, you're not just boasting, you're actually yourself reconnecting with it. And I think that's something that, you know, I'd, I'd observe back to the, there you go. I've got another bit of advice for the Harvard MBA, MBA graduates. Sure. Deliver your strategy as story and take every opportunity to tell that story. Don't let your strategy live on a sort of strategy on a page document. Think about it in, in narrative terms. Think about how you could tell that story of the strategy to other people and tell it often because that gets you back from doubt. That gets you back from a place of down and, and, and returns you to a place of up and energy and excitement if the strategy is good, if it's compelling, if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, well, you wouldn't have been able to put it into a story in the first place, in which case write a better strategy. But if you can, if you can story tell your strategy, there's clarity there. And if you then take every chance to tell it, start meetings with colleagues, like force yourself to regurgitate. What are we doing and why are we doing it and why are we going to be successful? And immediately that reconnects you and perhaps just elevates you a bit out of the particular day-to-day -day challenge that is causing the doubt or the difficulty. Mm. Yeah, I, I always get speechless because I, I find it really beautiful how you string all these sentences and words together. Your, your communication and branding strength really shows in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one more question before we tie things up. And if you could only send yourself a single line of SMS text to yourself five years ago, what would you send yourself? one of two things either very relevant to this stop talking Matt because I do talk too much <laughs> but but maybe the more profound and useful one would be don't get so emotional because I think there is a really fine line between caring and caring too much between taking things personally and taking things personally um, and I've often fallen on the wrong side of that line. And, and you know, you, you, you take things just way too personally. The, a sense of personal ownership and pride shifts into a, an emotional place of being upset because someone's challenged something or done something that you don't think is necessarily the right thing to do and everything becoming personal. And instead, actually just relaxing a bit and, and knowing that there may be mistakes that are irretrievably bad or damaging, but most won't be. There may be decisions that are critical to the whole future of the business, but most aren't. And therefore not allowing yourself to get emotionally invested in every decision, but maybe picking your battles for the ones that really count is a better way of both allocating your own emotional energy, but also when necessary, leveraging it because it really matters. So maybe don't get so emotional and don't take it so emotionally and personally would be, would be the SMS. Well, thank you for sharing that, Matt. And Finally, where can people find or learn more about yourself and Four Pillars? Uh, well, you can find and learn more about Four Pillars at fourpillarsgin.com. We're very grown up. We just shifted from .com to .au to .com, so that's exciting. You can come and find out more about Four Pillars at either the Four Pillars Distillery in, in Healesville in the Yarra Valley or the Four Pillars Laboratory, our new, our new act of customer intimacy, our little drinks 
Drinks and Gin Lab in, in Sydney, Surrey Hills. And you can find out a bit more about me probably on LinkedIn. Always happy to have a chat on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn inbox is a lot more empty than my real one. So yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn, Matt Jones, Four Pillars. You'll track me down. And always up for a chat about purpose, craft, gin, and taking things emotionally. Thank you so much, Matt. I will put all your links um, and, and details in the show notes. Again, congratulations on your world-class distillery in Surrey Hills. I've yet to come by, but I will definitely come by with the team. And I'd love to check it out. Thank you again for your time this afternoon. It has been an, an amazing chat. I've learned so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. All the links to the show notes will be available at kevinleysocial.com, spelled K-E-V-I-N-L-Y. Conversely, if you have any interviews that you'd love to recommend, please send it over to kevinleysocial at gmail.com. I'd love to connect. Thank you. Until the next episode.